Last week we ended at John 3.16. And I want to come back to it because this one's important. John 3.16, the world's most famous verse. And the guy shows up at every sports event with the same sign. I don't, I don't get it. There he is, John 3.16. It says, For God so loved the cosmos, the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. We need to remember who he's talking to here. He is talking to Nicodemus, a religious leader, very well respected. This is a guy who came to Jesus because he had this inkling, this hunch, this hunger that I don't think he knew where it came from. But it was a hunger to know more. Who is this Jesus walking around? I got some serious questions because something rings true of this guy, but he comes at night secretly and with the best intentions, seeking to understand. So he comes to Jesus. Now, he thinks he's going to Jesus, seeking. But the Father put the hunger in his heart to begin with. It was the Father seeking Nicodemus. Otherwise, it can't happen. It's initiated by our Heavenly Father all the time. So Nicodemus, a man who knows the law, he knows the rules. But suddenly some guys come along and, and shaking things up. He's teaching something that's different than follow the rules. You see, if you have a set of rules, you just follow them. There's no brain activity involved. As in having to think through, oh, what does this mean and all that? You can, but having a list of rules is about faith in a written scroll, in a written text. When Jesus died on the cross and gave us the new covenant, he took the Logos, the Word, and put it on the tablets of our heart. It's that Word, capital W, that we listen to. This written Word, beautiful. It reveals the Father, and we have much to learn from it. But this is not your Savior. This can't save anybody. These are good words. It's called a holy book or holy Bible, but it is a book. And when did the printing press first come out? Something like that, 1400s. So what did people do before then? Especially if you say you have to live by the Bible. Well, I love my Bible. I love what's written in it. It's harsh to say, but I don't live by the Bible. I live by the life of the Son of God who lives in me, who points out truth in the Bible. Do you see the difference? Anybody can read this without any spiritual insight, as many have. Nicodemus, he knew the Bible, he knew the rules in and out, and he was drawn to the one who was the Word. It was powerful. He said something different about Jesus. And he listened to the instincts within him to go speak to Jesus. You and I have the same instincts. In fact, it's even better. We have the Spirit of God living in us. It wasn't until the cross that we became one with Christ. So Nicodemus had a hunger put into him by the Holy Spirit. There's no way he could have gone to Jesus like that. Then Jesus meets Nicodemus. This is about discovering the character of Jesus Christ. His compassion for people. His love for those who are blind, for the lost. He seeks out this opportunity by saying yes to Nicodemus who's come to him. And the first thing he does not do, he does not judge Nicodemus at all. Funny. That's Jesus' first response. Who else would he have done that to? He never judged the woman caught in adultery. Didn't judge her at all. Hmm, first response. The woman at the well, first response. Didn't judge her. 
Jesus also does not judge you and me. He does not judge you and me. And yet, our society, one of the first things we do when we meet people and watch activities of people, we judge. That is not the character of Christ in you. That's a personal journey. You, you, you need to let Jesus change that mindset in you. You can't even do it on your own. But he's called us to love. He's called us to respond to the truth that's in us. Why did Jesus come? He came so that the world would believe in him. I love this verse. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. This messes up a lot of churchianity because some people think we have to judge the world. No, you can't judge the world. You can't even judge each other. How do you have all the insight? And your system of judging is very different than Christ's. The biblical system of justice. Do a study on this. You're going to discover something very different. Our Western culture is built on a Roman justice system. That system is based on this fact. Payback. You're judged and sentenced. You're judged and you've got to pay back based on what the judgment is. And we took that and we placed it in here and we have a misunderstanding of what it means when God judges us. One of the best definitions of judging here is the word God's opinion. His opinion of you. It's a powerful word. He did not come to judge us. He came to save us. He came to love this world. That tells us something about how we have been judging society. Looking at all their behaviors and saying, oh, how terrible you are. We would never act like that. Become a Christian and stop behaving like that. And it's all about behavior reformation. No. It's about complete recognition of the life that's been changed. And as believers, we experience salvation when we believe. You must believe. People are saved by believing in Christ. Through Christ. He does it. If Jesus did not come to condemn the world, why, are we con why do we have condemning words and attitudes? When Jesus spoke, he spoke life into people, not darkness. He spoke light. If you recognize your identity, you will recognize Jesus is your life. He is my life. When it says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Listen carefully. That word life is a person. Eternal life has a name, Jesus. When you believe, you have eternal life. Not when you die, of course when you die, but not as in the mindset that I had growing up, that when I say the prayer, yes, God does something to me, but I don't get eternal life till I die. Then eternal life begins. No, it's already started. It's living and functioning in and through you. It's powerful. It's the Holy Spirit's job not to speak judgment into you and no condemnation. Do you, do you ever get condemnation from people that love you? Marriage, kids, work. Condemnation is evidence that it's not from the Holy Spirit. And you need to reject that from your mind. It's too easy to just take people's words and believe them, and then we start to believe them because we let it in. Stop. If it's a condemning thought and brings you condemnation and shame, it never came from Jesus. It can't. For one, he has completely forgiven you and taken your shame away at the cross. So what's left? Nothing. He's made you right. Believe his words. It's a great way to compare. Say, hey, I, I, somebody keeps telling me I'm this, and it makes me feel really bad. Now, there are behaviors that we do need to change. This is not 
saying behaviors don't need to change. They have to, but they need to align with the Spirit of Christ in us. And sometimes we're so, how do I say, blockhead, uh, stubborn, that sometimes an outside voice can be the Holy Spirit speaking into you. But you may take it at first whiff and go, I'm not listening to that person. And later you go, mm, they're right. Happens in marriage a lot. Okay, on my side. So, <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> don't go off trying to change. Oh, I'm going to change that about me. No, don't. Let me encourage you instead, unless it's the Holy Spirit telling you to, but believe first in this Jesus who does not condemn you. If you've been believing in a Jesus who condemns and is always mad at you, you've been believing in the wrong Jesus. It's time to discover the identity of the one who lives in you. Here we've been so focused on discovering who Christ is in us. How about discover who Christ is? Or who I am in Christ, sorry. We talked about how, who am I in Christ. It's time to move on and discover who the Christ is in us. How good he is. And how he has made us right. And how he empowers and equips us. And how he guides our thinking. You'd be shocked if you saw and discover how much he is totally involved in your thoughts and actions. Let's keep going on here. He who believes in him is not judged. But he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come, capital L, into the world. And men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light. It doesn't say they're evil. It says they hate the light. And does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. This is big. But he who practices the truth, practices the truth, he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God, initiated in God. He's the initiator of good deeds. Do you see unbelievers do good deeds? Where do you think it came from? God. He's more active in this world than we typically give him credit for. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already. Here's the judgment. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Any word of behavior there? No. They'll be judged because of belief and unbelief. I believe that's the only difference left. Whether people believe or not. Period. Behavior is an overflow of what you believe. When you're afraid, your actions will experience fear, anxiety. We have a lot of problems in our society with anxiety and anxiousness and depression and fear. All these things are our thoughts, what we've allowed in. What you believe is critical. Critical. How you believe about God Almighty, the Father, is critical how you'll respond to Him. How you see Jesus, how you believe He works and loves and functions, will affect how you believe in Him. The Holy Spirit, is He just some little ghost off in the corner doing quick, 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 zip, zip, zip all over the place and has nothing intimately to do with us? You'll believe, if you believe that, you'll act like it. But when you see the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit as one, and you believe they are in complete union, oh, and you're in that union, and they have the same mind. Oh, and so do you. You have the mind of Christ. He's given it to you. You're possessed. <laughs> You're possessed by the Holy Spirit. Let Him animate His life through you. Quit being so fascinated with demon stuff and, and thinking they're so powerful. They're not. That's why we don't talk about too much here because you know what? I'm not going to waste my breath on a powerless thing that has duped and confused people for so long. I'm going to teach truth so that truth dries out the fear. That is where healing will come. 
it gets better. Light has come into the world, and men love the darkness. So the fact is this, the light has come, Jesus himself. And people don't want it. They want to reject it. They don't want their evil deeds exposed. Who else would have done that? Who's the first people in the Bible who didn't want their deeds exposed? Or let alone other things exposed. You know, like, they, they covered up. They were shamed. Adam and Eve. But please see this. Whose minds changed in the Garden of Eden after they ate from the fruit? Their mind changed, not God's. Holy smokes, that's different. Oh, they've sinned. I want nothing to do with them. Oh, they should have known. No way. Adam and Eve, where are you? Where are you hiding? He knew exactly what they did, and he went to them just like any other day, seeking them. They had become what? Blind and lost. Very good. <laughs> and we heard Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. If it's lost, folks, it has an owner. Huh. That's good news. That should change how you see lost people. They're already owned. They are all the children of God. But when they don't believe, guess what happens? They reject the light. They want to love their darkness and their evil deeds. And they are acting just like what they believe. I can now go to a person and with greatest confidence say, do you know you are clean and forgiven? Huh? Don't I have to do something first? No. It's been done. If you believe it, you'll experience salvation. You'll experience the glory of God coming through you and you'll be a different person. Because you believe you're someone else right now. And you'll become just like what you believe. What well, do you think it says in Peter? I think it's chapter two, verse or chapter two, for, uh, chapter Second Peter, chapter one. That those who have forgotten their sins are forgiven are nearsighted or blind and have forgotten. Church, we can't forget. It's easy to do that. Don't forget the power of the indwelling Christ in you who has the power to communicate truth to your mind and act out in actions and provide your needs even if he does it a different way than you had planned. Even if it did include steps in life that you did not see coming. It doesn't mean he orchestrates those steps he is grace in those steps with you for knowing what you're going to choose. His foreknowing doesn't change your ability to choose. Not at all. But he knows. He's here to speak to you. Speak to your heart and mind. They love darkness rather than light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light, so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. When you come to see the light, you're going to recognize who's been at work in you the whole stinking time. And you were thought, it was all you. <laughs> now it was you and Christ. You can't believe until he's indwelt. It's impossible. And you weren't able to believe until the cross took away the blindness and darkness. Because if they stayed in that garden and ate from that tree of life continually, they would remain forever in the state of their darkness and blindness. And God rescued them from the garden. He didn't boot them out because he was ticked off with them. Wrong parenting style. 
He took them out. And he had a plan. And it was a good plan. And when Jesus came, he finished the plan. He made Adam and Eve right. He kicked open the doors of the gates of Hades, went in and set captives free. Done. If you believe it, you get to walk out and experience it. If you don't, you'll practice the bondage, the darkness you're in. What will you believe today? Verse 22. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came to the land of Judea, where he was spending time with them and baptizing. John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim. Because there was much water there, and people were coming and were being baptized. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. I guess he's going to get thrown into prison, huh? <laughs> Therefore, there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples with a Jew about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, wait a minute, didn't they call Jesus Rabbi too? Yeah. Teacher, it's all it means. It means teacher. He who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. As in, they stopped coming to our church, and now they're going to that church. What's with that? That's really what it's going on, really. John answered, a man can receive, listen, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to them from heaven. How can you receive unless you've been given? And who's the source of giving? Who's the generous one? God. And who are you like? God. Which makes you generous. Makes you a giver. Instead of tight-fisted, making sure just your family's fine. We've been created to look out for the needs of others. But our minds have to believe that. And then we'll begin to experience what that road looks like. This is a powerful verse. This has everything to do with the revelation of people coming to believe in Christ. Who does it? Unless the Father reveals, they cannot see. People can reject. The revelation can come, the light comes, but they want the darkness. We can't change that. And when we start asking too many questions about that, guess what happens? You're trying to play God. You're trying to figure out, are they going to make it? Are they not going to make it? What do we got to do to get them to make it? Because I really want them to make it, because then my life's easier, because I don't have to pray for them anymore, because then they're in, and they don't have to be... You know what I'm saying? It's amazing our motives for wanting people to change. Unless it comes from heaven. They can't receive. It gets better. Oops, which chapter? It flipped. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but a friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him, Jesus is over there baptizing, okay, who hears him, Rejoices because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He knew his time was done. He knew he was the forerunner before Jesus. And he's declaring it. He must increase, I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth, John is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. He said it twice. Jesus is above all. He's above your circumstances right now, your stresses, your pain, your sickness. He's above it. Can you trust him? Can you trust him as the God of outcomes? He doesn't need your help. He wants you to receive his love. For he knows that a time will come when you fully believe you are loved. 
then you'll begin to mature and be who he's called you to be, to do the things he's called you to do. And there's much doing. So what's stopping you from believing? Your cozy little life, so happy with how things are going? Don't know. You, you answer that one. That's the Holy Spirit in you chatting. What he has seen and heard, of that he testifies. And no one receives his testimony. Now, what he has seen and heard? Where was Jesus previously? Experiencing heaven. In heaven, right? He was hanging out with the Father and the Holy Spirit. He shared with what he had seen. He also had to listen to what God said to him because as he walked this earth, he was abiding in the Father. And he's called us to do likewise, to abide in him. As Jesus lived, we also are to live. Not copy him. We're called to listen and abide to what he tells us. Nowhere does it say copy Jesus. There are behaviors that are wise to copy, but the point is listening to the abiding Christ in us. What he has seen and heard, of that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. When you believe, there will be an assurance a knowing God is true. You can't muster up belief. You can't do it. You can't say it a thousand times in, in a, with a candle, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. No, it doesn't work like that. The belief comes from Jesus, who is your belief. That's good news. It's not even your own faith. It's not your own belief. It's his belief that comes to you, and it's with that you believe. And that belief can't change. That is complete assurance. That is powerful. He who has received his testimony has set his seal to this. God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given some things into his hand. Oh, wait a minute. No. It says he's given all things into the Son's hands. Everything is Christ's. Believer, unbeliever. The chaos in this world. It's all his. Let's not get into the why question today. It'll mess us up. It's playing God again. Why? 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 Questions are good. Go talk to him about it. Believe first in him. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. Wrath. A couple of ways you can see it. If you see God as a Roman judicial God, then that can be seen as complete anger and, and turmoil. And there is room for the word wrath to mean anger, absolutely. But in that, the bet, I find the better definition, which absorbs anger, is any deep, intense emotion. That's what the word wrath means. In that, is anger deep, intense emotion? Yes. But so is passion and vigor towards you. The Greek word is orage. You can figure out the foundation of that word on your own. <laughs> Deep, intense passion towards you. No research. It may not quite mean what you think. But the point is this. He is going to be pursuing you without condemnation. Trying to love you into belief. That is the heart of your Father. Why? Because that's what Jesus has done. And Jesus is the exact representation of the Father. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen God. They're the same. And it wasn't until Jesus came that we finally, finally saw the Father. Every Old Testament writer did not give us a clear picture of the Father. It is not the complete picture of your Father. But when Jesus came, now you're seeing it. Now through that lens, go back and read the Old Testament. You're going to see some things very differently now. 
and there's some things you just can't make sense of. This is a bunch of things that are just really messing me up. So what? Ugh, fine, I'm going to stick with what you're teaching me instead of trying to get answers to things that I'm not ready for. Do you know how we do that, right? Google. <laughs> Don't trust all that. You trust the Spirit who's in you already to create the hunger for what He wants you to learn and provide you with the answers that He wants. If you don't believe today, I'm going to ask you to believe. And the only way you can believe is to listen to the voice in you who's saying, it, it's okay, believe in me now. Just ask God, believe. Father, I want to believe you. How, how do I get to believe you? Is there a prayer I got to say? Is there a magic chant? Nope. It's responding to the voice in you. And if he confirms that in you, you'll experience so much joy. It may even be emotional. It may not. No rules. That's the good news of why Jesus came. To bring you belief. So you can see your salvation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus who is light. For Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Teach us to open our hearts to the light within us, to the life within us, Jesus himself. Teach our ears to hear the voice of truth. And may we be conduits of your love and grace to other people in the same way as Jesus approached us without condemnation. May we approach others and refrain from condemning voices. Please begin those changes in us today. For I want to reflect your life and your love better and better as I grow mature. I've not mastered it, but keep working on me. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.